Picture this, a tunnel so long it could stretch from New York City all the way to Philadelphia. Now imagine carving that tunnel not through soft soil, but straight under one of China's most dangerous mountain ranges, the Qinling Mountains. These aren't gentle hills. They're steep, unstable, and full of underground rivers that can erupt without warning. Yet, somehow, Chinese engineers spent more than a decade boring a 98-kilometer path directly beneath them. And here's the twist. This wasn't built for cars or trains or even freight. It was built for something far more essential, water. Fresh, life-giving water that flows from the Han River in the south, under the mountains, into the dry and thirsty Wei River Basin in the north. For the first time in history, two of China's greatest rivers, the Yangtze and the Yellow, are now physically connected underground. Think of it like threading a gigantic drinking straw under an entire mountain chain just to keep a whole region alive. This tunnel isn't just an engineering stunt, it's about survival, about saving cities from running dry, reviving farmlands, and keeping millions of people from being forced out of their homes by drought. But why would a country spend billions, move mountains, and gamble on a project this risky? To answer that, we need to go back to the slow, silent crisis that nearly strangled central China. China's geography creates a strange and dangerous imbalance. In the south, rivers like the Yangtze and the Han often overflow during the summer monsoon, flooding towns and farms. But in the north and central regions, where millions of people live and some of the country's biggest industries operate, water is scarce. It's like one side of the country is drowning while the other is dying of thirst. The Qinling Mountains, the same range that the tunnel cuts under, are the dividing line. To the south, wet, green, humid. To the north, drier, harsher, and prone to drought. This divide isn't just physical. It has shaped China's culture, economy, and food production for thousands of years. But by the late 20th century, the imbalance had turned into a full-blown crisis. Imagine running a factory or growing crops in a place where rivers literally vanish for months at a time. That was life in the Wei River Basin, part of the Yellow River system. Cities like Xi'an, a historic capital with millions of people, were running dangerously low on water. By the 1980s, shortages were no longer seasonal. They were permanent. This is where the paradox gets sharper. While water in the south flowed abundantly into the sea, central China's rivers cracked into dry beds. That gap between surplus and shortage pushed the country to ask an extraordinary question. If nature wouldn't balance water on its own, could humans do it instead? By the 1980s, central China's water shortage wasn't just inconvenient, it was life-threatening. The Wei River, once the lifeline of the Guangzhou Plain, began shrinking until some sections disappeared completely for more than 100 kilometers. Imagine walking along a riverbed that should be flowing with water, only to find cracked earth stretching to the horizon. Cities like Xi'an, with thousands of years of history, were suddenly running dry. Factories struggled to keep machines running. Farmers watched their fields wither season after season. Families lined up for hours just to collect rationed buckets of water. In some neighborhoods, taps worked only a few hours a day, if at all. And when surface water ran out, people turned underground. Wells were drilled deeper and deeper, sucking up groundwater faster than nature could refill it. At first it worked, but then the land itself began to collapse. This is called land subsidence. Roads cracked open, houses tilted, and in some cases the ground literally sank beneath people's feet. By 2003, the crisis hit a breaking point. Shanxi province faced its worst drought in recorded history. Reservoirs dried up, crops failed, and dust storms replaced rainy seasons. Even Hanchong, a region usually rich in rainfall, saw its harvests wither. Millions of people were living on the edge, unsure if their land, their farms, or even their cities could survive another decade like this. It was clear, without a radical solution, parts of central China could become permanently uninhabitable. And that looming threat forced the country to think bigger than ever before. When a crisis grows too big for local fixes, the only option is to think on a national scale. That's exactly what China did. As the droughts deepened in the Wei River Basin, engineers and policymakers began looking south, toward the Han River, a massive tributary of the Yangtze. The Han had water to spare. Every year, billions of cubic meters flowed down its banks and into the Yangtze, eventually spilling into the sea. Meanwhile, just a few hundred kilometers north, the Wei River was starving. The contrast was impossible to ignore. What if, instead of letting that southern water rush unused to the ocean, it could be diverted to keep the north alive? 
This idea became part of an even bigger national vision known as the South to North Water Diversion Project, the largest water transfer scheme in human history. Its goal, to redirect trillions of liters of water from the flood-prone South to the thirsty North. Imagine it as a giant plumbing system for an entire country, with canals, tunnels, and pipelines replacing nature's rivers. For central China, the solution was bold and almost unbelievable. Dig a tunnel nearly 100 kilometers long under the Qinling Mountains, and use it to link the Han River directly to the Wei. In essence, take two of China's most historic rivers, one tied to the Yangtze system, the other to the Yellow, and stitch them together underground. It sounded impossible. But in 2003, as the drought crisis reached its peak, China approved the project. The gamble was made. If engineers could carve this hidden water bridge, it might rescue millions of people from thirst. On paper, the plan looked simple. Dig a tunnel, lay concrete, and let the water flow. But in reality, it was, honestly, one of the hardest engineering projects China had ever attempted. The Qinling Mountains weren't just tall and rocky, they were unstable riddled with underground rivers, fault lines, and high-pressure water pockets that could burst like a punctured pipe at any moment. To put it in perspective, most of the world's famous tunnels, like the Channel Tunnel between Britain and France, are about 50 kilometers long. This project demanded almost double that distance through even harsher geology. Engineers had to push through layers of hard granite, then suddenly switch to soft, collapsing soil. Every few kilometers brought a new surprise, from toxic gas leaks to hidden caverns flooding with groundwater. Traditional methods just weren't enough. China brought in massive tunnel boring machines, each one the size of a small skyscraper lying on its side, to grind through the mountains. But you know, even these machines had limits. In places where the rock was too unstable, workers had to dig by hand, reinforcing the walls as they went, sometimes inch by inch. The danger was constant. Imagine standing inside a tunnel, where millions of tons of rock are pressing above you, knowing a single mistake could trigger a collapse. Yet, despite cave-ins, equipment breakdowns, and endless delays, the work pushed forward. It took more than a decade of drilling, reinforcing, and innovation to carve out the full 98 kilometers. By 2020, against the odds, the tunnel was complete. A hidden river now flowed under the Qinling Mountains, proof that the idea wasn't just a dream, it was real. When the final barriers were sealed and the pumps switched on, water from the Han River began its historic journey north. What once flowed naturally into the Yangtze now detours underground, through a tunnel nearly 100 kilometers long, before emerging into the dry Wei River Basin. Here's how it works. Intake structures along the Han River pull in water, which then travels through the massive underground channel, carefully controlled by gates and monitoring systems. At the other end, the water surfaces and merges into tributaries of the Wei, recharging reservoirs, rivers, and canals across Shanxi province. The numbers are staggering. Each year, the tunnel can deliver over 1.5 billion cubic meters of water, enough to supply tens of millions of people, irrigate hundreds of thousands of hectares of farmland, and stabilize water tables that had been sinking for decades. Cities like Xi'an now have a reliable water source, reducing dependence on overpumped groundwater. Farmers who once watched crops fail now see fields turning green again. But the project isn't just about survival, it's also about resilience. Sensors throughout the tunnel track flow rates, water quality, and pressure, making sure the system runs smoothly. Engineers compare it to a beating artery, one that must keep pumping steadily because if it fails, an entire region suffers. And while the water is finally flowing, it's not the end of the story. The project has transformed lives, yes, but it has also sparked new debates. Because when you move water from one river system to another, the benefits for one region can become the burdens of another. Every engineering miracle has a price, and the Han Tawei River diversion is no exception. For the dry north, it has been a lifeline. Cities like Xi'an have avoided catastrophic water shortages, industries can keep running, and farmland once on the brink of abandonment is producing again. Millions of people now rely on this redirected water every single day. But in the south, where the Han River begins, the story looks different. Every cubic meter sent north is a cubic meter lost downstream. Communities along the Han worry about falling water levels, especially during drought years when their own supply tightens. Fisheries that depend on steady flows have reported declines. Even ecosystems along the middle Yangtze, 
including wetlands that shelter rare species like the finless porpoise, feel the effects of reduced water. And then there's the human cost of construction. To build the intake reservoirs and canals feeding the tunnel, thousands of people were relocated from their homes. Some villages vanished entirely under rising waters. While compensation was paid, many families struggled to rebuild their lives elsewhere. Environmentalists also warn that changing natural river patterns is like rewiring the body's blood vessels. It might solve one problem, but create new ones over time, from altered groundwater tables to shifts in regional climate. In fact, some scientists compare it to borrowing from tomorrow to pay for today. So, while the project is hailed as a triumph of engineering, it's also a reminder. Moving water isn't like moving cargo. When you take it from one place, another must live with less. The Han Wei Tunnel is a marvel of engineering, but it's also a mirror, showing us the future challenges the world will face with water. It proved that humans can move mountains, drill nearly 100 kilometers underground, and even stitch together two of the greatest rivers in history. But it also showed that every solution comes with new questions. The lesson is clear. Water scarcity isn't a local issue anymore. It's global. From California's dry reservoirs to India's shrinking aquifers, countries everywhere are wrestling with the same dilemma China faced. How to keep people, farms, and industries alive when nature no longer provides enough. Some may look to China's example of mega projects, while others may turn to conservation, desalination, or smarter technology. But one thing is certain, the 21st century will be shaped not just by who controls energy or technology, but by who controls water. In that sense, the Honda Way Tunnel is more than a pipe under a mountain. It's a glimpse of a future where survival depends on our ability to reimagine the natural world itself. So the next time you turn on a tap, remember, somewhere under the mountains of China, a hidden river flows, carved by human hands, keeping millions of lives above water. And that story may soon echo far beyond China, into every corner of a warming, thirsty world. At its core, the Han to Wei Tunnel is not just about pipes, pumps, or engineering records. It's about what people are willing to do when survival is on the line. Thousands of workers risked their lives underground. Billions of dollars were poured into carving a river through stone. Entire landscapes were reshaped, and even ecosystems were rewritten. All so that millions of people could have what most of us take for granted every day, a steady flow of clean water. In history, great civilizations have always risen and fallen on water. The Egyptians depended on the Nile's floods. Mesopotamia thrived between the Tigris and Euphrates. When the water failed, so did the empires. China's tunnel is a bold attempt to break that cycle, to say, we won't wait for rivers to change, we'll change them ourselves. But this achievement also raises a sobering thought. If water is life, then whoever controls water controls the future. Today, China has shown the world one way forward. Tomorrow, other nations, struggling with their own droughts and climate shifts, may try even bigger, riskier projects. The question is, will humanity keep racing to bend nature, or will we learn to live within its limits? The Honda Way Tunnel is a symbol of both hope and warning, proof that we can do the impossible, but also a reminder that every victory carries a shadow. And maybe that's the final lesson. Water isn't just a resource. It's the foundation of life, the thread that ties civilizations together. And how we manage it, wisely or recklessly, will decide not just the fate of cities or nations, but of the world itself. So why should a tunnel in the middle of China matter to you, sitting thousands of miles away? Because water scarcity isn't just China's problem. It's coming for all of us. From farmers in California watching reservoirs dry up, to families in Cape Town rationing daily use, to cities in India struggling with groundwater collapse, the struggle for water is already global. The Han to Wei Tunnel is one country's solution, but it forces us all to ask tough questions. How will we handle our own shortages? Will we gamble on massive engineering projects? Or will we invest in smarter conservation and cleaner technology before it's too late? If there's one takeaway, it's this. Water is becoming the new oil. The resource wars of the future may not be fought over land or energy, but over rivers, aquifers, and rainfall. And the choices we make today, whether to waste it, protect it, or re-engineer it, will decide how secure our world is tomorrow. Now I want to hear from you. Do you think mega projects like this are the answer to water shortages, or are we just borrowing from the future to fix today's problems? Drop your thoughts in the comments below.
Because this debate isn't just for engineers or politicians. It's for everyone who drinks a glass of water each day. And if you found this story eye-opening, don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and share it with someone who should know how water is shaping the future of our world.